Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me is, is a newcomer into the temple, coming to us from Bud Stuff Games. Get your head out of the gutters, people. No, no, no. <laughs> and creator of the upcoming We Can Be Heroes. Make your David Bowie jokes. We've heard them all. The one and only Spencer Reichley. How are you doing today, man? I'm doing well. Thanks so much for having me on. Thank you for com thank you for coming on and for putting up with, with all my bad jokes. <laughs> I love it. Love it. I'm here for it. Mm-hmm. So, a bit of a tradition around here is opening with the humble beginnings. So, walk me through your first introduction to role-playing games in general, um, and then we'll get we'll get into superhero games in a bit. And what made it stick? Yeah, um, absolutely. So, I think I started off like a lot of people did with uh, Dungeons and Dragons. Um, Fifth edition was my first into it and it wasn't that long ago it was about what six or seven years ago um so still pretty fresh compared to a lot of gamers and creators out there but um yeah i was working at a guitar shop supply uh place and we got a new guy in there from uh he came in from texas um and he's uh, one of our developers uh his name is uh, smiley and he uh, he turned to me and another one of our developers uh, we were all working together there he's just like Hey, you guys uh, ever play Dungeons and Dragons? We're like, no, but definitely super into that. And uh, yeah, I mean, from there, we just, you know, we've had so many campaigns, so many one shots. Um, and then uh, years later, we started designing this game and uh, just started something special, man. Mm -hmm. And when it comes to the idea of doing a superhero RPG, where was your... What was your first introduction to the idea of superheroes in tabletop form? Sure. So, um, really, I had not played uh, anything up until um, up until I decided to design this game. Uh, so, kind of a weird approach. Um, me and uh, some friends were looking to start a superhero campaign. So, I looked at all the all the ones out there. There's a hundred out there, and they're all really good in their own right. Um, but none of them really just clicked for me. None of them were like how I pictured a superhero game. Um, so, of course, I then dedicated the next few years of my life to designing one um, that like suited my, uh, you know, my tastes and my play style. Um, and uh, the more we play tested it, the more uh, people, strangers, uh, just like really loved what we were doing. And mm -hmm. um, it's a different approach. Uh, it's definitely not as like crunchy as some of the uh, some of the older ones uh, where you're. Uh, you know, doing a ton of math and uh, stat buys and stuff. Um, but yeah, so um, again, so many good superhero TTRPGs out there. We're just uh, we're just happy to be, you know, kind of making some noise in the scene. Yeah, and you had, you had mentioned that you you started designing We Can Be Heroes because a good chunk of the superhero games you had already been playing weren't quite hitting the mark. So. I'd like to play a little bit of word association. Think of this as a really bad Rorschach test. <laughs> okay. I'm going, I'm going right. to give you a name of a given Supers RPG, and you can tell me if it was something you were familiar with, something you had played, um, any co any comments to that extent. To that extent, like I said, sure. think of it like the Rorschach inkblot test, just dumber. Oh. All right. Um, champions. Uh. Let's see here. I want to. I do want to be, uh, uh, you know, it's somewhat uh, diplomatic here because uh, they are competitive. The, oh, well, not yet competitors. We're not a competitor to them. All yet, fair and love and riffing. Yeah, for sure. Uh, let's uh, let's go too crunchy. <laughs> um, masks a new generation. Uh, too narrative forward, but also awesome. <laughs> All right. Um. Necessary Evil. Uh, I've not played that. 
Um, I haven't read too much about it either. I, it is on my radar, though. Yeah. Um, DC Heroes slash Blood of Heroes. Ooh, that's one I want to try. Um, again, I haven't played that one, uh, but I've heard good things. Mm-hmm. Um, Marvel Phase Rip. A- another one that, um, man, a lot of people talk to me about that one. Um, and I think that one had a uh, cool uh, reputation system built into it uh, from what I remember reading about it. DC Heroes' big claim to fame was was introducing a physics engine. You know, a, a, oh, unif- cool. a unified, a unified um, physics engine as far as how its number crunching worked. Okay, nice. Yeah, we uh, we built something like that into our game to make sure that you know lifting and throwing and uh, hitting stuff and being thrown into stuff uh, does the right amount of damage and you know has the right effects. Um, Marvel Heroic. Um, I've not played that. Haven't read about it either. Yeah, that that was. That was that was a Margaret Weiss Productions project during the Cipher Plus, uh, not Cipher Plus, um, Cortex Plus days. Nowadays, nice. that's been reincarnated with Cortex Prime. Um, let's see. um, Pandora. I've not heard of that one. Um, that's an interesting one by Todd Crapper. Um, okay, Mut- Mutants and Masterminds. Um. Again, too crunchy, but also I think that's I think Mutants Masterminds is probably the gold standard for superhero TTRPG um, at this point. I don't know if I'd call it the gold standard, but it definitely it definitely was when it came to using the D twenty sy- system for that. Yeah. Um. Sentinel Comics. Uh, that's one that is like that's probably the first one I'm going to play once we're like settled and like we've got our Kickstarter are done and everything. I've been waiting to play a lot of these until we're done designing the game. Cause I don't want to steal anything. Um, and so it's like, that is one that um, everybody's recommending to me and everybody talks to me on our discord channel. People talk about it all the time. Um, Marvel multiverse. Oh, that's the new one. Uh, I haven't gotten to play it yet. Um, I've heard uh, mixed reviews. Um, I did my own review of it. I wasn't too fond of how, of how they did of how they did things that and uh-huh. um, instead of, instead of trying to go a more general route, they decided to build it on the current Marvel Comics runs, which you're getting people coming at this from a lot of different angles. Yeah. So I don't think that was a good idea, especially yeah. in regard to say the X Men. For sure. Yeah. Um, icons. I can't. Uh, that's uh, another one on my list. I have not played it though. Mm-hmm. Um, I have heard that it is uh, that it is also pretty crunchy. That's uh, kind of a you know constant theme here yeah. with my word association mm-hmm. uh, and something that we try to avoid yeah. uh, with character building. Um, this is lo- this isn't exactly supers, but um, cartoon action hour. Oh, I've not heard of that. That sounds up my alley, though. What's well, uh? I'm gonna have to look that up. Uh, can you uh, elaborate on it a little bit? It is. It is. It de- it describes itself as a 1980s action cartoon RPG. So I think that alone tells you all you need to know. Oh, cool. Yeah, I'm looking it up right now. Uh, oh, that's really cool. Okay. Uh, cool, like GI Joe type art with the not the just He Man, not just GI Joe, but. Le- let me read off some of the series books that, that I have for it, and you can <laughs> see, you can kind of get a feel for what for what it's trying to make it make a nod to. Um, crime stri- crime strikers. Um, okay. Crusaders of Sir, of of Cerulean. Flag okay. Force. <laughs> um, <laughs> Galactic Heroes. Hex Slinger. Infinovators. Iron Wolves. <laughs> Punk oh Rock saves the world. Star War- awesome. Star Warriors, the Dark Brigade, <laughs> the Mighty Mirror Masters. Wow! Oh my Wasteland god! 20- Wasteland 2010. Oh man, I'm gonna have to check that out. That's a, I mean, that's a really cool concept, and we definitely went for like in our art style, we went for like a Saturday morning cartoon type of vibe. Hmm. Um, maybe more along the lines of the early 2000s. Uh, uh, late 90s uh, Saturday morning cartoons rather than the 80s and 90s. 
uh, yeah, that this appears to be going for. Which yeah. I'm, I'm glad to see because if I'm being honest, 80s cartoons are a little bit overexposed in fandom. There's way too much stuff that came around in the 90s that ev- that people conveniently overlook. Until until it's convened yep. when they want to when they want to bring up um, Batman or gargoyles or the like, You're right? And that and then go back to saying that the '90s completely sucked. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, I enjoyed it. Which, I enjoyed the '90s, but as a child, so all yeah. that stuff. Uh, like, yeah, it makes me so happy. Yeah, I I, it's one of those things I have I have to call out when pe- when people um are are that are that um bit of, bit of Janice faced. Yeah, for sure. Oh, and as as far as necessary evil, the premise with that is the the villains ended up winning over the heroes, and t- but then an alien invasion happened, and they're like, "Well, fuck! Now we got to be heroes because we're because the aliens are trying to take our stuff." Oh, that's cool. Okay, <laughs> I like that concept a lot. Oh, there was also an interesting concept called base raiders that was. The, doing this idea of the bit the big bad villains ha- have disappeared, and the, and um not, and a bunch of heroes have found out where all their layers are. Oh, that's cool. That's also very cool. Um, yeah, the I'll idea keep... of, uh, of a villain's layer is uh, super intriguing. It's a uh, and a really cool. Yeah, so you have a bunch of abandoned vil- um layers of villains. Of course, just... uh, that's super cool. Oh. Uh, now, with now with that in with that in mind, I am a bit curious if at any and if at any point you had played City of Heroes, the Super's MMO. Yes, yeah, uh, actually a, a huge inspiration for the game. Um, yeah, I mean that was uh, like the early two thousands when I was uh, in high school. That was my jam. Mm-hmm. And I loved it. You have you heard have you heard about what recently happened when it came to the City of Heroes private server homecoming? Yeah, I think so. They got uh, what permission to like open that up, right? And it's it's they have, to, like, they've been they've been content? given a um, development license, so they can oh they can keep supporting yes. it with uh, with NCSoft's blessing. Let's go! Yeah, I uh, I would jump back into that. I would uh, I'd love a good graphics update on. That. <laughs> I'm sure it's. Well, not as cool. As remember, well, there, but, yeah. there was an attempt at a graphics update. It was it's it was known as Champions, um, Champions yeah. Online. That didn't quite work. Nice, yeah. That's uh, but, that game. I mean, when I, when we were designing this game, um, you know, I was like looking back at old screenshots of City of Heroes. Like, like how did I build heroes back then? Because it was so cool. Like that was my favorite part of the game, building heroes out, and then I'd start the game over. You know, every couple of weeks with a new hero. Uh, never leveling them up enough to uh, be truly powerful, but that's uh, the curse of any RPG for me. Just always want to make new characters. Mm-hmm. But now, what? Now you had mentioned with some of the ones I that I talked about that they that they were too crunchy, and that's always been something of a problem when it comes to supers games. Because because of the sheer amount of variety of characters that they have to encompass, with yeah. s- with some rare exceptions like Hit the Streets, which is solely focused on um, street level heroes, so it doesn't really have yeah. that problem. But you ev- you you end up having one of two extremes: you have the really crunchy end where where you have stuff like champions, mutants, and masterminds, and, and the like. Or you, or you have the very narrativist end, like um, masks, where the power system is put is um, fill in your fill in your power here and and just have the GM wing it, which yep, the which is cert is certainly the opposite end, but the but um whether you swing the pendulum too far to the left or too far to the right, the problem is you've gone too far. Exactly. So yeah. So with yeah. we can be heroes. Um, how are you? Tr- how are you trying to address the middle ground so that it, it so that it's so that it isn't too crunchy or too um, narrativist? That's a really good question um, and something we really focused on. Like that was really important to me uh, when I was designing this. I want it to be in the middle there. You know, I want character creation to be fun and 
weird, you know, and uh, I want you to have uh, cool, fun abilities that work mechanically in combat and role playing. Um, but then, how do you account for those big, giant superpowers without just getting bogged down? You know, talking to your GM for you know five minutes on a turn. Uh, we wanted to be fast paced, like fast paced games. So uh, what we did, we have uh, superpower archetypes. Is how uh, I landed on decision here. So superpower archetypes, uh, we break it down into strength, agility, intelligence, um, particle manipulation, nature, and I think I'm forgetting one. Uh, oh yeah, psychics and psionics. Mm-hmm. Um, and then underneath each one of those archetypes, there are several superpowers that you can choose. Um, when you choose one of those superpowers, uh, at level one, you are presented with a superpower attack or superpower ability that you can use using a uh, limited resource called Hero's Favor. Um, and um, that kind of, that Hero's Favor, you know, you get more and more as you level up. Um, so you can use more superpowers. And then as we were playtesting that, I was like, okay, cool. Yeah, these superpower attacks are super fun and they hit, uh, you know, really well. Like they're uh, big time attacks. But like I am shooting ice at people, but like how do I create an ice wall? to like stop you know bad guys from entering this room full of civilians um because it's not written in the description of my superpower attack yeah so then we introduced the concept of hero's favor for flavor is what we like to call it um where you can work with your gm to kind of uh, be like all right i want to spend a hero's favor to create that ice wall hmm. um i want to spend a hero's favor to uh you know uh, melt this uh uh this uh billboard off the top of this building to drop it on some enemies um uh, you know it's not within the description of your superpower attack but we want people to have the ability to be creative um and you know embrace that narrative uh or that uh, collaborative storytelling with your game master Mm -hmm. now you also have you also i can see where the city of heroes setup is um present because you have a kind of mix and match set up with um yeah your your primary your primary um set up your exil- auxiliary powers your secondary powers kind kind of the way you had the mixture of role and power source in city of heroes and even even if you had the same ro- the same power source but different roles you could have completely different pools of abilities exactly yeah yeah that was a huge thing I pulled from City of Heroes for sure. Uh, mm-hmm. Just looking back, like how did they, how did it, they make it so well rounded? Yeah. And where, where, where would you say the line is between, um, between what would what you would consider a, pri- what you would consider a primary type of power and what you would consider secondary or auxiliary? Sure. That's oh, that's a good question. Um, it was really fun to come up with that too i had you know a spreadsheet going like all right what do i consider superpowers what do i consider secondary powers uh because uh green lantern and superman could both fly uh but that's not their superpower right like so flight is a secondary power to me Hmm. um teleportation um you know you've got several heroes who could do that uh but you know nightcrawler is different from uh, while it is nightcrawler's basically basically his superpower um, he's also a skilled fighter and, a, and an acrobat. So um, it, it was just kind of listing those out and just kind of ranking them, um, doing a ton of research uh, through like the Marvel encyclopedia, the DC encyclopedia, like, all right, which powers do superheroes, you know, have most often um, and which ones are truly special. Um, and then auxiliary powers are just like, okay, how can we make it just one step cooler? Like, how can this be, person be really good at fighting? How can they just be a little bit tougher? Um, can they be a little bit cooler, you know, like uh, you know, embracing the public merit system we have set up too? Um, there's some really good options and uh, uh, in there, and yeah, that, that helps round it out. Along with the innate abilities too. Hmm. Those are tied to the superpower themselves. Uh, so another way to just round out your character and make it truly unique. Yeah, and even though the archetypes have their own asso- their own associated um power sets i get i guess i'd say 
I, bl I believe yeah. there, I believe when it comes to uh, when it comes to auxiliary and and secondary powers, those are a bit more freeform. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, they're definitely um, there to just build on the hero you had envisioned. Yeah, and given that, given that. I would I would like to ex I would like to explore a, f a few um a few concepts cuz sure. there there's been a sh there's been a short list there's I did I did a ran I did a random power set um gen generator experiment in a stream on this channel previously and whenever it comes to tackling supers characters this this is one of those things I like to br I like to bring in um oh. In, reg in regards to v in regards to various characters, so I'd like I'd yeah. like to I'll give you the skinny on a on one of the on some of the characters' um, power sets in this, and you you can tell me which one, which um which power which power sets in we can be heroes you think would be the best fit. Cool. Okay. So one. And I I will admit around the time that I came I came up with this um I had um Hiroaka back in the back of my head so take so make so keep that keep that in mind but okay yeah and uh, also um yeah I mean just a um to be upfront like some some heroes you cannot create in our system uh, we've mm -hmm. discovered that um like uh you know we tried to do Martian Manhunter and it's just he's got to too much going on you know he's so good superman is another tough one you can make a superman-esque character but mm -hmm. um yeah i mean let's let's go for it though this is yeah. exciting i like this so the first one is cal bridger aka jet falcon who is essentially it is essentially a technomancer the key th the key thing is that it is that any bit of tech he he touches he understands it completely and built and built a power built a um, kind of harness that's that has a modular setup that only he really can use because it's built with his powers in mind. Uh, so that okay. that sort of that sort of tech it's tech technically a gadget um, archetype, but not in but not in the Batman like sense. I've compared, sure, yeah. I've compared him to I've compared him to Forge. That's the closest analog I can think of. It's just cool. that he goes a step further. Instead of being support, he, like I said, he essentially essentially built a modular suit that can fulfill that can fulfill different roles, a la um, season two of the Iron Man cartoon. Okay, yeah, that uh, so superpower right off the way, <clears throat> right off the uh, top of my head. Probably AI assist. It's under the intelligence archetype, um, so you immediately get to know like uh, defensive threshold, current HP of the target, um, and you get to make an attack and stuff. Mm -hmm. um, secondary power. That's uh, oh, a tech master for sure. Um, so you get um, you know bonuses to your analysis and science. Uh, you get upgrading gadgets uh, like bonuses uh, at later levels. Mm -hmm. Auxiliary power, um, man. So there's a lot of good equipment boosts: uh, armor, lug head, which you can improve like vehicles or something. Uh, gunsmith, um, go go gadget, which is uh, you know craft gadgets at half the public merit cost. Um, and then crafty might be a good uh, ox power for for that character. Uh, you get to add like a bonus to uh, rolls when you're crafting or improving equipment. So we've got it a. a whole equipment improvement system built into the game mm -hmm. uh that's really fun it's a fun little mini game and uh, uh with like a, a varying degrees of success too so when you improve equipment it's uh either uh, a mediocre success a, a solid success or great success mm -hmm. uh so everybody's got different equipment throughout it's really fun yeah i can i can get that and Another another one that's that's in the list is Finn Hako, aka Foxfire, who is <laughs> is is Japanese Scottish. He is for all <laughs> intents and purposes for all intents and purposes he can do what a um, Kitsune is able to do. 
So a fair amount of fire manipulation, a fair amount of illusions, and is is also a notorious prankster. Nice. Okay. Um, cool. So right off the bat, uh, uh, he's working with fire. Then we've got the fire burst or flaming hot. Uh, so fire burst is you know ranged uh, specialization, and flaming hot is uh, more melee. Mm-hmm. Um, and then. Oh, let's see here. So, like, illusion stuff. Um, that's a good... Uh, that's a tough one. Uh, maybe refabrication for a secondary power. Uh, that's more healing than illusions. Um, uh, teleportation might be good. Um, yeah, might not have a secondary power for, for that one. Um, auxiliary powers... Oh, well, actually, so we'll go to hero trait, uh, jokester. Uh, so if, uh, if he's, uh, got a good sense of humor and he's, uh, messing with people and stuff, you know, hero traits, uh, those are like how your hero acts, uh, in role play, uh, also provides you with your starting equipment and, uh, some other bonuses. Um, mm-hmm. we've got some really good ones in there, uh, reformed villain, um, jokester, um, you know, vigilante, that sort of thing. Mm-hmm. Oh, so an- another in- another instance would be Amelia Curtis, aka Sonic Bloom, who's her whole th- her whole thing is cre- is creating these air pockets that she can launch herself through. The problem Ooh. is she's not very good at the brakes part of it. <laughs> so she <laughs> she is the type who would bo- who's going to be bouncing around arenas like a cannonball. Oh, that's cool. Um I mean, honestly, the speedster uh, agility power, uh, you could definitely flavor it in that exact way. And just, it sounds like it would honestly work really well because you get to make like multiple attacks um, and just bounce around the battlefield. It's, uh, we just did a, uh, a live play podcast or an actual play podcast. And uh, one of our, one of the guys did a, did a speedster and he just absolutely crushed. It was real fun. Yeah. There's been a, there's been a bit of a running gag of, Leave the windows open for when for when Amelia comes in because she do- <laughs> she doesn't have an, she doesn't have a good concept on hitting the brakes. Her idea of the brakes is perfect. when she hits something. That's awesome. When she hits something, yeah, that's that's, str- that's stronger than she is. Um, see another another. This would be an interesting challenge. Would be Marcus Houch, aka Backdraft, who. His whole his whole setup is that he's a, he's essentially a le- a a kind of lightning rod when it comes to energy. He's not far removed from say Bishop. He's able to okay. absorb and and redirect energy that he's hit with. Perfect. Um, yeah. So superpower archetype uh, under particle manip- manipulation mm-hmm. and go kinetic charge for sure. Uh, that was uh, obviously modeled after like Gambit. Hmm. That sort of thing, um, but then with the secondary power, either damage absorption or damage reflection. Yeah. Probably reflection uh, so, because cool. if he gets hit with a fireball, he's throwing a fireball back. It's not like you can. Ch- yeah. It's not like he can change it. Perfect. It's... Yeah, yeah. Absorption is like you store the energy, and then reflection is just like basically right away uh, hmm. countermeasure. Yeah, uh, you're just whipping that back. Hmm. Um. I suppose an- another one that might. That would be an interesting challenge. Is Zaha Rademacher, aka Hardcase, since she's something of a power mimic, but not directly. She makes constructs that mimic powers that she knows. The limitation is she can, she can only make it. She can only give one power effect to one construct, and can only make a limited amount of constructs at, at once. Okay. Um... That's a challenging one. Maybe duplication and just flavor it in the way you want. We always invite, you know, people creating heroes, you know, flavor these uh, superpower abilities or attacks however you want. Mm-hmm. But duplication, that's uh, one of the instances of superpower abilities rather than attacks where you're creating a duplicate of yourself or in uh, her case, they could uh, create, you know, their uh, that entity mm-hmm. um, and just give it uh, a healthy dose of HP uh, to go into battle with. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Now, 
with now with that said, obvious obviously a lot of games are going to have their all roads lead to Rome when it comes to the when it comes to die mechanics and as I under, as I understand it, you are you are using D twelve and then later D then later D twenty with your core mechanic. Yeah, for the superpower attacks. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, yeah, levels one through nine. Uh, well, I guess so. A superpower attack, uh, you use a target die, mm -hmm. uh, superpower dice, and then your moxie, which is uh, like a modifier. Mm -hmm. The target dice level uh, one through nine is a d12, and levels ten through twenty is a d20. So you know it gets it gets stronger. That swing is just so big, but superpower attacks always hit mm -hmm. since you're using a limited resource, the hero's favor I mentioned earlier. Um, you know, we were playing without them always hitting, and it was just like, this sucks. I'm using this limited resource. It's killing me. Like, I can't miss this attack. Um, so we decided, all right, what if we just make it a big swing in damage? And uh, and it's worked out really well. People really enjoy it. Um, when you hit big, it is super rewarding. When you hit small, it's still fine. You know, it's like, all right, well, did a chunk. So it's a case where you're you're instead of rolling to see whether you hit or not, you're rolling to to see how to see how successful the action is when it comes to correct. The yeah, exactly. Yeah, so that's where that target die kind of comes into play. It uh, kind of represents like how well you're hitting. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and uh, with weapon attacks and gadget attacks, that's still using the uh, like the d20 uh, plus a modifier, uh, you know, roll over system. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah, roll to attack with weapons and gadgets, but yeah. with superpowers, it's always going to hit. And the fact that you're using you using levels at all is certainly going to be unorthodox for supers games because mm -hmm. a lot of them go full freeform, which right obviously has the going full freeform has its benefits, but the drawback is one a balancing balancing freeform. Oh, you know, yep. as far as balancing encounters. It's and two, things can go all things can go all over the place, and you can run the risk of min maxing. Yep. Yeah, and there's definitely still a way to min max in our game for sure, um, if you want to. And if you want to, you could do you know a level two hero with a level twenty hero, um, if if you really want to, if your GM wants to handle that type of balancing nightmare. But <laughs> really, we wanted uh, this game to be pretty cohesive uh, as far as teamwork goes. Mm -hmm. um, and the best way we've found is to keep everybody at the same or a similar level uh, for the sake of the GM sanity. Um, you're still going to have a really good time playing cool superhero, you know, action scenes and role playing. Yeah. Um, and if one person is Superman and another one is, uh, you know, uh, Electra, then it's like, all right, well, this is, the super unbalanced team, and while the uh, difference there can be a fun thing narratively, it's uh, mm -hmm. it's frustrating in a game. Yeah. Now, I do also find it interesting that that you are using hexes, but you but instead of um the instead of the standard five foot approach, you're having zones which are twenty feet per hex. Yeah. Um, now, is it a now, even with that, is it a case where you could have PCs and opposing NPCs in the same zone? Oh, absolutely, yeah. We haven't put a limit on that yet. Um, if you've got a bunch of enemies in the same zone as you, uh, then your defensive threshold goes down a bit. Mm -hmm. um, so there's like a flanking uh, mechanic there. But it is, uh, we've had so many fun just all-out melees, you know, in, in a zone. Uh, we were playing with the 5x5 five five squares, and it was just... Uh, the speedster is what uh, made me change it. We had a speedster and I was like, oh my God, I cannot sit here and watch you count out, uh, you know, 16 squares. <laughs> it's, it's killing me. Um, so I'm actually, the glad large to see, I'm actually glad to see that because that whole thing of we need to do the f five foot grid and all that, that is an art, that is an artifact of the, of skirmish yeah. war gaming. And, while there are supers based skirmish war games, that doesn't quite fit the fantasy. Right. Yeah, it needs to be free flowing and fun and fast, like like a superhero movie or TV show or comic book. Like uh, you need to explore the space uh, that you're given, mm -hmm. and really opening up uh, each zone uh, is just like 
uh, it it just changed uh, it changed the game and the way we approach uh, yeah. you know designing this. Now I know that weapon attacks are are one th are one thing in there. I'm guessing that you have a standard we a standard weapon list, but do you also have mm -hmm. um a bit a bit of space on how to customize or reflavor the existing weapons for some of the more unorthodox things? Since well, just use an example. There's there's in a standard weapon list, something like say the glaive that Blade had <laughs> in the movies wouldn't right. quite be there. You know, just use that as an yeah. example. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so uh, with a lot of the things in this game, we invite people to flavor them how they want, um, as long as your GM's cool with it. Um, we also have the weapon improve or the equipment improvement mechanic, where there's a whole list of improvements you can make on weapons. Um, and if you're, you know, if you're starting off at like kind of higher levels, then your GM should let you have, uh, you know, an improvement or two, mm -hmm. uh, when you're starting off. Yeah. Um, so yeah, there's definitely ways to make those so cool. And a common thing with, within, co within comic books is not necessarily upgrades to characters per se, but rather side grades, you know, some, some sort of gadget or the like that's used to address a particular problem and and ke and kept in reserve and not made part of the regular kit is that something that you guys have accounted f for when it comes to we can be heroes that's uh that's a good question i i guess we haven't really accounted for that um purposely uh but uh you know you can still have uh, even if you don't have like expertise with like a like say a short range weapon or a gadget, mm -hmm. uh, we'll say a gadget, um, you can still use a gadget. Uh, you're just not going to get to add your moxie modifier to when you do use it. Um, so you can have that stuff on the side. Um, you can have people improve things for you. Mm -hmm. And when now, when it comes when it comes to the talent system that you have, the vibe I get from that is that talents are not far removed from what would be attributes and skills in other games. But right. what I find interesting is the is the um combined ver the combined version of it which kind of kind of addresses the skill problem that can happen. You know, where yeah. where um there's a bit of a there's a bit of a sunk cost when you've already got a few points in a given skill to that disincentivizes um taking up new skills because they'd have to play catch up since they since they'd be used in isolation yeah absolutely yeah um with the whole talent system we wanted it to be pretty free flowing um so yeah i mean you start off uh, rolling 12 d4 and mm -hmm. then you assign each one of those dice rolls to a talent uh which mm -hmm. lets you be totally creative with it mm -hmm. then yeah the combined talent rolls when you're um actually got that from uh got that idea while i was watching a, a browns game <laughs> and uh miles garrett um, you know, our uh, DB, he just, our defensive tackle, he just ripped through someone. It wasn't just strength. It was agility and strength. So mm -hmm. it's like, all right, so he's using finesse and muscle right there just to absolutely overpower people, get through, and achieve his goal. Mm -hmm. um, so I was like, all right, well, I've never done a combined check before. It's going to kind of throw off the balance, you know, as a GM. You're like, all right, so what do I do to make that check uh, achievable but still – hard to hit and you just kind of we did some a lot of math to make sure that we uh we've got good suggestions in the book for those mm -hmm. now in lo keeping that in mind what in the what is the super power die because that with the pre-gens with and the hero cards that you got on your side that's brought that's brought up so what would that yeah. entail is that just a catch-all for when you're you when you're doing an action that isn't covered by powers um, that is uh, basically only used when you're using a superpower attack or ability. Mm -hmm. um, and um, yeah, it is different for each uh, superpower that you can choose. Um, so like if you go to, like, if you're looking at duplication, I was just looking at that, that's a D4. Mm -hmm. uh, it can be any uh, D4, D6, D8, or D10. Mm -hmm. um, so just depending on what superpower you choose, uh, it is assigned a superpower dice and that is just included in that role. Uh, do super power die scale up as with level or are they going to be static? Uh, they are static, but uh, as you level up, you gain 
more heroes favor that mm -hmm. limited resource that you used to spend mm -hmm. and when you make a superpower attack um you can choose to spend more heroes favor to increase that dice amount yeah and with... and uh so yeah. go ahead sorry so given that i'd like i'd like to i like to get get a bit of a feel for what Tier, what tier of pow what tier of power would would apply to certain die sizes? Like what yeah. sort what sort of powers would be would be equivalent just to give kind of a a um a broad a broad strokes vibe. Um, so what would be what would be the what would be kind of powers that would grant a D four die, for instance? Uh, those are usually uh, relegated to like the um, support classes. Mm -hmm. Um, so if you're look, uh, like, so we've got, oh, psionic shield. Uh, so you're, uh, basically creating a big psionic bubble that uh, protects you or your teammates. Uh, so that's a D4. Um, and, uh, that's because like, all right, I'm not doing an attack here, but I am creating like a barrier, um, something cool, uh, that helps my team. Um, so it, uh, we kind of relegated those to the support levels. Mm -hmm. um, D6 uh, D6 uh, that's going to be your like uh, kind of mid tier um, I'm going to be doing uh, I'm going to be attacking probably multiple people uh, with my superpower attack uh, kind of right off the rip um, you know a lot of the powers eventually down the line are all targeting multiple people uh, but you know earlier levels you're like alright so yeah, D6 um, going to hit multiple people Mm -hmm. um, D8 D8 you're starting to get uh, into the kind of chunkier uh, uh, you know the chunkier guys um, so we got um, try to pull one up real quick so D8 um, psionic blades uh, so um, you know it's just a kind of a big time uh, superpower attack that's focused on uh, on damage with some uh, auxiliary in there too mm -hmm. D10 D10. Uh, you're looking at Big Mad. Is uh, it's the first one I came up with. Uh, it was uh, you know, it's your Hulk type power, mm -hmm. uh, a barbarian's rage state. You just like, uh, you're you're there to do damage. Yeah, big damage. D12. Uh, so there are no D12 uh, superpower dice. The D12 is just uh, the target dice. All right. Now the, there if is I, one. I might have misspoke earlier. Yeah. Sorry about that. There is one. Um. There is one sort of, not necessarily power, but well, one sort of setup that I'd be curious how this could be adapted into. We can be heroes, and that and that is the the um, transformation approach. You know, much much like how you ha how you have tr how you have transforming heroes, especially in the Togusatsu at end of the spectrum, or you have. Um, timed trans transformations or timed effects, you know, like say how how Ultraman can only be in that f in out in the open for three minutes, just to use one example. Yeah, like how how would somebody adapt those kind of setups into We Can Be Heroes? Um, so there are uh, a few powers that you know just have that built into it already. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I mentioned the Big Mad uh, thing. So that lasts um, until the end of your next turn, um, and then it gets better and better as you level up. But yeah, um, that would just be uh, if you want to incorporate that into your character as like kind of a flaw or something like that. Maybe not a flaw, but like a um, you know a part of their abilities. Then yeah, that would just be something you'd uh, really write into their story and talk with your game master about. Uh, it kind of falls in that narrative end, I think, uh, yeah. for our system. In the same vein, I I mentioned earlier the uh, mo the modular Iron Man suit that he had in the '90s cartoon. Um, yeah, with all with all those different forms, how would that be handled? Because that's that's another that's one archetype that Super's games can struggle with. Yeah, that is uh, that is a challenge. Um, I don't know if we've got that figured out either. Uh, you know, it's. Um... We do have, you know, tech armor available with uh, cool improvements there as well, and different abilities within the tech armor. Um, so that can be uh, flavored narratively that way as well. Um, yeah, I mean that's where 
uh, we really just try to let the openness shine, um, you know, uh, more on the masks spectrum of, uh, of the games. Uh, you know, we want to find that balance and I think it's necessary. Mm -hmm. I, I can, I can certainly get that. Now with, with that, with all that said, um, when it comes to when it comes to creating NPCs, creating villains or the like, do you have it that it works the same way as creating characters, or is there a different is there a different approach? Oh yeah, definitely a definitely a different approach. Um, we have converted uh, a lot of heroes and villains that we've created uh, into um, you know stat blocks, but um, our developer uh, Mikey, he. Um, Man, he came up with uh, he devised this like whole system on how to generate enemy stat blocks because um, we were struggling with it. Uh, you know, I had built out a bunch of them and they were just for play testing and they had a lot of issues. And he just uh, went in over the course of like two months and just cracked the code. Uh, so we've got a pretty expedited way to create enemy stat blocks and get really creative and fun with it. And uh, in the final version of the game. Uh, we should have um, like a guide on how to create enemy stat blocks uh, easily and uh, while well, you know, remaining creative with it. Mm -hmm. I I can get that. And one one of the things that you highlighted right out of the gate on the Kickstarter that I did want to touch on is the is the fact that you kind of have your own um, reputation resource present. Yeah, yeah, the uh, public merit system. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And the fact that not only is it you, not only do you have that, but you have multiple forms of public merit, which I find I find to be far more interesting because not all not all reputations are created equal. This is this this isn't the whole Paragon Renegade thing, <laughs> right? And, which in and of itself created created some conundrums back back with Mass Effect, but that's another story. But you have multiple ver versions of it. Is it a case where doing heroic doing actions um, generates the resource and you can spend it for um, favors? Exactly. Yeah. So um, there are five. Yeah, five um, different categories in the public merit system: uh, media, government, scientific community, corporations, and underground. Mm -hmm. um, and um, when you choose like a hero trait when you're building your character. Uh, you uh, basically get a focus uh, category and you earn bonus points in that throughout your adventures. Um, but yeah, we've got like a whole tier system built in. So you're like unlocking rewards as you kind of uh, gain more points. You can spend those points um, on favors, call to actions, intel, um, or equipment. Um, and then once you reach that tier, you can like, it, you know, you're not going to go below that tier again mm -hmm. unless if you do something insane uh, like a total murder hobo run or something yeah we, uh, but that's what the underground is for right like, mm -hmm. <laughs> and when it comes when it comes to when it comes to the the point thresholds that you had put in the thing you had sent me i do appreciate that you have them um streamlined i.e oh, yeah. the point thresholds are, are always a multiple of four and it, it could be yes. a multiple of just of just about anything, but the fact that there is sure. that universal baseline is appreciated. Um, Absolutely, yeah. We um right now actually the rest of uh, rest of my uh, development team is uh, actually uh, play testing the public merit system. Mm -hmm. um, uh, our guy Ryan, he uh, man, he uh, he he devised a system on how to uh, test out each tier. And how to incorporate spending without having to do a full campaign because that was like all right uh we don't have time right now to do full a full-on campaign in this system uh to play test this whole subsystem you know it's our currency system essentially mm -hmm. he came up with this genius uh genius mini game that we've been playing uh you know every uh, every time we can and uh it's it's real fun uh, so we're narrowing down those tiers and like the you know the amounts that you can earn uh, it's really helping out, balance, like helping balance that system. Mm -hmm. Now, with with that set, with that said, when it comes to like, I know I do also appreciate that you have a um, a built a built in 
a built-in pseudo setting when it comes to some of the locations with the cities. Yeah. Since um some there are there are some games that don't quite get the idea that you need to that you need to have some sort of setting to built to build around, especially when it comes to what sort of um subgenre you're lean you're leaning into. I've criticized the world's most litigious role playing game for this and how it how it wants to do how it wants to do um any kind of fantasy but not really. <laughs> right. The whole, oh, yeah. you can you can use D and D to run any kind of fantasy. And yeah. yeah, but yeah, but so <laughs> but so much of it skews towards towards Western Europe. So it's, right. And if you want to do anything beyond that, you're gonna have to do more house ruling. And yeah, you can do that. But I've I've always said house ruling should be a spice. And I don't know about you, but I don't like I don't like drowning my wings in hot sauce. <laughs> Um, I don't mind uh, a lot of sauce on my wings, but uh, but I see what you're saying, and uh, and I I agree. Oh, well, better um, example, you don't drown your steak in pepper. Good call. There we go. All right. Um, but yeah, the, I mean, creating a setting uh, for this game is super important to me. We're gonna have five uh, fleshed out cities, um, with you know lore, important NPCs. Um, we've got. Uh, sports teams already named for each setting too. We uh, had a fun sit down session with that. Um, that was pretty fun. Um, maybe some, maybe some yeah. of them are lovable losers. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. Well. Uh, yeah. The uh, one of the first cities I came up with was Steamland, which is uh, you know uh, lovingly named uh, after uh, or designed after Cleveland or uh, you know Cincinnati, Pittsburgh, mm-hmm. Indianapolis, the Rust Belt, uh, Detroit. Mm. Um, and it's you know our dark and gritty kind of uh, Gotham esque uh, city. Um, and we've got Center City, which is you know our metropolis, our New York City. Mm-hmm. Um, San Valentino, which is uh, down in the southwest, so like Nevada, uh, Texas. Um, what else? Marine Town, Pacific Northwest, and then Playa del Codicia, which is like a Miami, uh, Miami Beach type, um, mm-hmm. you know, resort town. So we've got because... some really good stuff. Because somebody wants to do Miami Vice in superhero form. Oh yeah, they do. Yeah, <laughs> it's a. Uh, oh. We've actually had a lot of interest in that when you know in our Discord, uh, people love that city. Yeah, I've um, I oh when I did, when I when I did that set of characters that I that I um, pitched earlier, um, it was for the it was for the idea of doing a Heroes Academy, but but in the Great Lakes area. Nice. Um, Cool. Because they're be, mostly because as a at, a lot of people make jokes about Minnesota weather, but the reason it gets so weird is because there's three different biomes in the state. You've got plains, you've got wetlands, and you've got forests. So yeah. that's three different types of moisture levels getting into the atmosphere. Um, it would also it would also make it a um. I guess a a a white black green deck if you're playing magic. <laughs> right. There you go. Yeah. Yeah, we uh we're incorporating like uh districts and uh cool stuff into into each setting too. Um to make sure that it's not just, you know, if you're going to Steamland, it's not just uh the dark and gritty city. There's uh the suburbs outside of it and uh um Marine Town, which is our Pacific Northwest. That's one of my favorites. Uh, because it's like so, like it's like an eco-conscious kind of uh, forward-thinking uh, city. But there's like a nice uh, national park outside of it uh, called uh, uh, Mount Cowell or Cowell Mountain, named after Mount Hood. You know, yeah. just a total ripoff there. But <laughs> if you're gonna steal, steal from the best. Exactly. Oh, and I'm I'm guessing with each of those, there's story seeds and rumors that AGM could build a campaign around. Absolutely. Yeah, we've uh, so the book will have the GM guide in there and uh, the GM guide has a bunch of plot hooks with the different uh, organizations we've built into the lore uh, with important NPCs from different areas. Um, And then, of course, you can move those NPCs to any setting you want. Um, Yeah, lots of lots of tools for GMs to uh, build a cool uh, plot hook Mm -hmm. or a full campaign. Yeah, and 
I will admit when you talk about introducing gig economy ver versions, the the vibe I get for that is um is a more professional version of the Heroes for Hire. Yeah, yeah, we uh, incorporated the app Soup Finder, mm -hmm. uh, which is uh, it's been great when we're doing uh, one offs and playtesting and stuff. It's like, it's like Uber hey, for you're superheroes. One hundred percent. Yeah, that's <laughs> that's the idea. It's uh, it's hilarious and it provides a lot of really funny moments too mm -hmm. when you're role playing. I can I can definitely I can definitely see that because like I got three stars from this guy. What the hell? <laughs> <laughs> I lifted a car off of him. Yeah, because the. I've I've and I'm, I am a bit I am a bit curious given the given the wide amount of stuff that can be done especially since the vibe I'm getting with this setting is that superheroes are a, are a part of everyday life in the in this setting. Um, yeah. Is there is there an is there an equivalent of any sort of of hero school or or university or the like that teaches people to be um, heroes basically in an equivalent of like the the Xavier Institute or Avengers Academy or something like that. Uh, nothing built into the lore yet, but it is, um, you know, we've tossed around a thousand uh, expansion ideas. Um, and one of them is definitely like the heroes Academy. Mm -hmm. um, you know, my hero academia, uh, professor Xavier school uh, for the gifted. Yeah. Um, any, any of those. Uh, and it's been done so many times that it's something that we kind of put on the back burner. Like, mm -hmm. All right, let's focus on our world, and there's got to be something like that in the world, well, though, right? I mean, it's a lot of times so when cool. that a lot of times when that's yeah. done, it's done as as if those academies are high schools, um, right? I think it'd be an interesting thing to explore to have it be um, be like both high, yeah. be both high school and co and college. Essentially, um, high school high school ones are more of a more of a feeder system the way colleges recruit for athletes. Yeah. Yeah, I guess. Um, so we do have something kind of built in the lore. It's the um, United States Bureau of Supers. Uh, mm -hmm. So USBS. Um, so they uh, oversee like Soup Finder um, and stuff. So there is like a kind of a training program or like a way for heroes to uh, start, you know, doing heroics uh, officially above, uh, you know, above board um, in the world. Um, so there is kind of something like that. So it, would be cool to build on that um and uh some sort of you know corpse or something like that to uh drive home that point of we're here to learn we're here to become heroes mm -hmm. and then of course there's politics that play into that as well uh you know would the usb we... would the usbs be not far removed from shield correct yeah like a shield um yeah that the idea behind it is um kind of in the civil war you know marvel um run like okay people need to be registered uh, to do hero stuff um so there is some resistance to that uh you know in, at least in my mind and the uh in the lore in my head um and uh so that could be a cool mm -hmm. uh you know fun little storyline that you build into your campaign yeah some tension uh, yeah and admittedly some of what i'm suggesting is just an evolution of something i've done with some of the fantasy settings that i've that i've done where adventuring Thanks, yeah. is a full is a full-on job exactly yeah yeah there's um in the when you pick an origin um there is a role table for like personal liabilities mm -hmm. um and one of them is uh one of them is like i have a full-time job and i got and i'm struggling like it's uh it's pretty fun it'd be a funny thing to put in there mm -hmm. uh, and with with that in with that in mind, um, what are you shooting for as far as a release window? Not a date per se, but a ballpark. Sure. So November, uh, we'll have we'll be shipping out books. Uh, we've got a printer lined up. Um, they are super dependable and come highly recommended. Uh, they're at Jostens. They're actually a yearbook company, uh, but they print a bunch of uh, tabletop RPGs and stuff uh, in their off seasons. Um, so yeah, we've, uh, we'll have some time to, you know, finalize the interior design of the book and, uh, play test some more stuff. Uh, but it is, it's, it's pretty good to go. It's, uh, it's, it's, uh, in a really good place. We're really happy with where it is. Mm -hmm. Um, and yeah, we were going to 
uh, released our Kickstarter back in November and decided to push it because we wanted to make sure that everything was good to go. Mm-hmm. And I will certainly be looking forward to seeing how it develops. But oh, yeah. with that said, I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come on come all the way to my sh to my temple and enjoy the uh, madness that happens around here. <laughs> I really enjoyed being on. Uh, this is great. Thank you so much for having me. And anytime you see fit to return, the door is always open. As I often of course, say around yeah. here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. <laughs> I should have cracked a beer. I didn't know that was an option. <laughs> and of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra. I am your gaming monk. Stay fucking frosty, everybody.